On Halloween Day, 1982, future Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees Daryl Hall and John Oates released a new hit single called Maneater. It was about a woman so strong-willed and beautiful that any man whose eye was caught by her would end up being chewed up and spit out, powerless against her dominant femininity and allure. Maneater went on to be the music duo's most iconic song ever, at least according to the record charts. It reached the pinnacle of being a number one hit on December 18th, 1982, and lasted at the top spot for four consecutive weeks, more than any other song they ever released, which is a list that included hits like Private Eyes and Kiss on My List. Now, you may be wondering, why am I talking about this iconic song in a video game review? And I guess it's time to clear things up. While this Maneater turned out to be a Smash Runaway hit, this Maneater, unfortunately, did not. Tripwire Interactive's newest title sees you take on the role of a deadly bull shark who is on the path of revenge against mankind. On your roughly 8 hour journey to complete the main campaign, you'll shred through 8 distinct water filled regions, killing wildlife and humans with reckless abandon as your shark grows more and more powerful. You'll see your once baby shark grow bigger and bigger, as well as more dangerous, as it not only matures, but also gains access to upgrades and evolutions that allows for a few types of build diversity. It's a formula for a pretty decent game, so long as your expectations aren't sky high. But alas, a few design choices drag down this experience like a sinking ship. The game has far more issues than any other I've played so far in 2020, and I will be highlighting all of them in this review so that you can better inform your choice on whether or not to buy this game. The funny thing is though, this is a game that grew on me. I viewed it unfavorably in the first few hours, but it's a title that won me over, in part, by the time it concluded. At least enough to say, yeah, that was an alright time. And that's pretty much my overall thoughts on the game, so let's dive into the deep end. With that, welcome to Dangerous Waters, my review of Maneater. A very bare-bones story and a basic presentation style means that the most definitive aspect of Maneater is its gameplay, so let's start there. After a short tutorial to learn the controls and flow of combat, your large shark is incapacitated by the likes of this bloke, meet Scaly Pete. It's revealed this shark was pregnant, and after ripping off Pete's arm, you're thrown into the bayou where your new journey as a shark infant begins. And this journey does take place in an open world. There's eight different water biomes to navigate, and each is home to main story missions, additional side quests, and a ton of collectibles. There's eight chapters in the game, and each chapter takes place in one of these biomes, and you'll finish each chapter in roughly an hour, depending on how much of the side content you engage with. The open world structure is one of the better design choices in the game. Playing as a shark means it feels natural to be in the open waters of Sapphire Bay or the Gulf, but it also grants that cool feeling of being somewhere you don't belong when you travel to the swamps of Fatwick Bio or the tourist attractions of Caviar Key. These areas are also just about the right size, big enough to feel distinct, but not so vast that going from one location to the next feels tiresome. So that's the open world, now let's talk about what you can actually do in these waters. There's really two components to the gameplay, combat, and collecting, both of which get very repetitive very quickly. For the most part, each of the eight explorable areas is home to three sets of collectibles. The first is nutrient caches that gift currency that's needed to level up. The second are license plates that are supposed to be hard to reach but usually aren't too bad. And the final one are landmarks that breathe a little life into the world. 
These collectibles are sprinkled in pretty leisurely throughout the world and aren't hard to come by, especially since the sonar upgrade outlines them in your vision. It doesn't demand much from you as a player, and the only real challenge in nabbing them all is the pure quantity of them. Whenever I was swimming to the next area for a hunt, and I saw one, you know, I'd stop to nab it. It's a harmless inclusion that doesn't really add much or detract much from the experience. Collecting all of these collectibles may give you a few hours of extra gameplay after the credits roll, and it does make for an easy platinum trophy, so I can't really complain much about their existence. You know, it would have been a nice complimentary piece to go alongside of a fantastic main gameplay loop. That is, if the main gameplay loop actually was fantastic, but that just really isn't the case. Gliding through the open waters surrounded by wildlife or breaching the waterline with just a fin while stalking your prey represents the pinnacle of movement in the title. You actually also do a little bit of land traversal in this game as well when going after certain collectibles and it's quite humorous watching your shark turn into this blubbery behemoth and just kind of jump his way towards a human snack or a license plate collectible. Movement is at its worst when you're engaged in combat, as you'll constantly be trying to relocate your targets and accidentally breaching the water only to have to dive back down. The best term I can use to describe it is realistic, but it just doesn't feel great to control. Speaking of combat, it's what you'll be spending most of your time doing in Maneater, so let's break it down. So, many of the creatures you encounter aren't threats to you and can be eaten up without resistance to gain upgrade currency. There are of course some predators though that will come after you including barracuda, alligators, other sharks, and whales. In order to take them out, you'll have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, or I guess fin-to-fin. -fin. When the enemy tries to make chum out of you, you'll want to use the dedicated dodge button to get out of their way. The problem is that your ability to move freely in any direction is somewhat limited, as I alluded to a moment ago. When you pair this up with an ineffective lock-on system, it doesn't take long for a level of frustration to kick in, as you can't always see an enemy coming in order to dodge his attack. There is a sound cue, but I found it wasn't as helpful as seeing the enemies lunge head-on. And this problem is exacerbated when you take too much damage and have to swim after some of the docile creatures in order to eat them up for health. The enemy will be swimming after you from behind, but you can't track it and your meal alongside of each other, meaning that often you'll just have to end up taking more damage. At least your offensive capabilities end up being a bit better than your defensive ones. Your main attack is of course your deadly bite that rips into the flesh of enemies. You can also tail whip foes as well as toss smaller foes into larger ones, and while those systems are a bit more flashy, I can't deny that I barely ever used them simply because biting foes was the dominant strategy. I barely ever felt the desire to tail whip a foe or launch some other creatures at bigger ones, simply because biting things was so much more effective given the control scheme. That's the biggest weakness of combat, it's so repetitive, you just spam the bite button and occasionally dodge out of the way until the gator or the shark or whatever is mincemeat. Repetition can be okay though if the actions are done quickly enough, and that's why I was still able to enjoy the combat system a little bit, simply because it didn't drag on with its repetition. At the end of the day though, it's still not stellar in any way, shape, or form. A lot of these issues also carry over to fights with humans as well. Most of us landlubbers go down in a couple bites, but take out enough of them and hunters will spawn literally out of nowhere to kill you. Seriously, sometimes they just spawn right next to you. Anyway, their damage output and level is tied to your infamy rank. The higher it is, the more damage they do. You increase your infamy rank by taking out bosses, but we'll talk about those in a minute. The battles with humans on ships are a little bit better than fighting underwater foes, at least in my opinion, because in that case, the sea is completely on your side. 
it's easy to lose track of the enemies, only to leap out of the water for a surprise attack and do lots of damage. It's ultra satisfying. Bottom line, sneaking up on humans and consuming them is a fantastic feeling in any shark game and that continues to be the case here. They will shoot back with weapons that auto lock onto you and will hit you guaranteed unless you dodge in time with a button press. It's kind of arcadey in that way, but this entire game is, so that's fine. I mean, enemies have numbers jump off of them when you hurt them and it doesn't get more arcadey than that. So that's a look at basic combat. You'll be spamming bite attacks against underwater foes, while fights against humans feel a little bit more cinematic and worthwhile, at least to a small degree. Speaking of cinematics though, there are a plentiful number of boss fights throughout the game, and they include going against apex predators underwater, as well as the land's top hunters above the surface. The hunter fights are the more challenging ones because they are accompanied by other human hunters who may distract you and provide additional pressure. It's more engaging, especially later on when the legendary hunters you need to kill take a position in hard to reach spots on the ships. On the other hand, the fights against the apex predators are essentially the same as facing their normal level counterparts with the stipulation that they have more health. They do the same attacks and do a bit more damage, but really they aren't any different than the fights you've already done, which leaves them feeling kind of underwhelming. And to be quite poignant, whether you're fighting people or creatures, the rhythms of combat are very repetitive. Once you've engaged with it once, you've pretty much seen all there is to offer in terms of combat. The whole fighting experience ends up being routine by the game's conclusion. It's just alright. Nothing terrible, but nothing amazing. In an attempt to alter gameplay, evolutions and upgrades are given to the player after defeating bosses that can be used to customize your shark and theoretically change up gameplay. You can level each upgrade farther by dumping in currency points that come from killing people and creatures. The problem is that most of the upgrades fall into one of two sets. A bioelectric set that allows you to do AoE lightning damage with stun effects, or a bone crusher set that gives you additional defense and more physical damage. You pick a set and then you roll with it, and it doesn't lead to as much diversity as there could have been. The short runtime paired up with this minimal amount of builds may lead some players to feel that the open world RPG label that this game gave itself may be a little bit misleading, but that's for the individual player to decide. Anyway, there's also three additional slots to equip upgrades, but they're fairly basic ones like more health or more currency gained, it's nothing innovative. I ran the bioelectric set the entire time, and to be honest, it trivialized combat and did mountains of extra damage. So much so that the final Apex Predator hunt took me about 30 seconds as I had the thing stun locked to death until its health hit zero. It was hilarious. The upgrades make things easier, but not in any sort of interesting ways that enhance the combat experience. Oh, but I should note, while the upgrades themselves aren't too spectacular, I loved seeing my shark mature visually as it got older and bigger. That was always much more satisfying to me. So what I've just described is a lackluster combat system that seems to be devoid of any sort of fun, but really that isn't the complete picture. There's something inherently enjoyable about playing as a shark and wreaking havoc, but it has to come in short bursts. When you're a game developer, there's only so much you can do when you're gonna have the player control a somewhat realistic grounded shark creature, and so I think the runtime for this game feels about right. Play it in short bursts for maximum enjoyment. Anyway, I think ultimately, your enjoyment of this title's gameplay will come down to one factor. Do you enjoy checklist style gameplay where you are constantly working towards 100% completion? That's what this game is all about. You'll be completing many, many tasks in short bursts. At its best, it feels like the side content of Insomniac's Spider-Man game 
but at its worst, it feels like the repetitive dribble of Mafia 3's mission structure. Your mileage will vary. For me, I found it enjoyable enough to see the game through to the end, and I kind of want to go back and finish it for 100% completion and the Platinum Trophy. Next up, we come to the presentation and performance, and it's here where the game has the majority of its issues. Let's start with the music since it's the most non-intrusive. The music of this game is nothing special. It's forgettable. I finished the game the day before writing this, and I can't remember anything about the tunes, not even a single note for crying out loud. If anything, it's mostly background music that's drowned out in favor of the underwater noises and sound effects. The sound effects were serviceable, again, nothing special, but this game certainly wasn't trying to be The Last of Us Part 2. And nowhere does that make itself more obvious than in the graphics department. This game looks like a PS3 title most of the time. The graphical detail is pretty low and the textures are pretty bog standard. The game also has an issue with color saturation at times. It seems like they just kind of want to flood you with bright blues, yellows, and oranges, and it's just a bit off, not all the time, but sometimes. But nothing in the game looks worse than the infamy hunters in their cutscenes. Like, my god, these people are hideous and very poorly animated. In the end, I wasn't expecting this game to blow my mind graphically, but I would have hoped for a step up from what we've got, especially since this is coming at the end of the PS4's life cycle. And what really surprises me is how much these graphics sent my PS4 Pro's fan into a fit of rage. Seriously, I've never heard my console's fan kick on this often and be this loud while playing any other game. I don't get it. And unfortunately, things get worse when we move to the performance department, as there's a ton of issues here. First of all, the frame rate of this game is wildly inconsistent and will often dip during combat heavy sections, which leads you to have to eat a lot of damage. It feels cheap and frustrating. I died at least once or twice on low health because the frame rate just decided to chug and I couldn't time a dodge properly in order to avoid the killing blow. This came early in the game against a fight with a beefed up alligator and seriously pissed me off because the gator was almost dead. It was almost over and then it got me because of the frame rate drop. I've also already mentioned the camera's woes, but the lock on function also sucks because creatures will constantly zip off out of range, leaving you unaware of their position. In order to maintain the lock, the camera would have to do like a 180 sometimes, which would maybe lead to some seasickness, but I just hate when the lock on camera doesn't stay locked on. It's just counterintuitive to the name itself. And finally, the last major issue, and the most damning, is that this game has released with a bug that will occasionally delete your entire save file, or at least hours of progress. Many players are reporting this happening to them, and it's something that I experienced firsthand. Luckily, I was only about an hour into the game, but it still felt terrible to see my progress wiped. It is one of the easiest and quickest ways to upset a fan of video games. I'm not sure if this had any real impact, but fast traveling to a safe room and then quitting to the main menu was my strategy to exit the game, and after doing this, I never lost any more progress. So in short, the presentation and performance of this game are its worst elements. That leaves just the story, and it's kind of a mixed bag. Like I mentioned earlier with the gameplay, controlling a shark doesn't leave a ton of room for an involved and impactful narrative. I mean, even if you create dynamic and well thought out characters to counteract the shark, at the end of the day, you are just a shark. You're not going to talk, you're not going to solve moral dilemmas, you're just going to destroy everyone and everything because you are a shark. Creating some grand narrative outside of the shark's world is kind of pointless because the player will always feel disconnected from it given their allegiance to the shark. That's why I'm kind of forgiving towards the story of Maneater because it's mostly in service to the gameplay. 
I think they recognized that this game didn't need a gripping tail and just came up with some basics to keep us playing and progressing and I think that's fine. At the game's beginning, your shark's mother is killed by a hunter named Scaly Pete, and in an act of revenge, you bite his hand off and escape into the open waters. After completing certain chapters, you'll check in with Scaly Pete to get updates on how he's doing. We find out he's trying to teach his son Kyle how to be a hunter, but is kind of disappointed with his lack of interest. About halfway through the story, a dramatic event unfolds, and Pete is as motivated as ever to kill you, which culminates in a final showdown at the game's conclusion. I mean, I don't want to spoil it, but yeah, don't expect much. If anything, the ending was a little disappointing and inconclusive, which kind of surprised me that I even felt that way at all because I didn't really feel any connection to the story. The best part about this narrative is that it's told from a documentary perspective as a narrator comments on the actions taking place in game. The shark hunting sector has experienced significant growth, leaving a lot of local openings for amusement ride operators. His words will give you a chuckle from time to time, especially when explaining the landmarks you find, as well as when hunters show up to attack you. It's actually pretty decent and doesn't break up the flow of gameplay, so a good job, it's well done, and it was a smart choice. When I look back on this review, I understand that a majority of it was about bashing Maneater, and while I think those critiques are 100% true and that they are necessary to bring up, I can't deny that this game did win me over in the end. I am a sucker for slow progression towards 100%, and the checklist nature of the game was good enough for me. Alongside of that, while most of the combat encounters feel automated and spammy, a few of them were able to break free of this mold and feel like action-packed and graceful undersea combat instead of repetitious drivel. Still though, this game has a myriad of issues, from the dull combat encounters to the terrible performance issues and the downright ugly graphics. The save file deletion is also an unforgivable sin that needs to be addressed. On top of that, the narrative just isn't anything special, although I do sympathize with the dilemma of having to make a shark story gripping. At the end of the day, I can't in good consciousness recommend buying this game for $40, but it is one I could nudge someone into buying when it goes on sale. It's one of those games I personally enjoyed despite its flaws, but I'm not sure that everyone else will. So, all I can do is caution you on your purchase. These are dangerous waters, after all. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Consider subscribing for more. Follow me on Twitter at NopeNapNarp. And as always, have a nice day, and take care.